OK, then. So I'd like us to, as far as possible, maintain some discipline to try to use the framework to, <laughs> to extract um, more generic lessons about the advantages and drawbacks of each of the different approaches to innovation, which we're characterizing one as more open than the other, not as a value judgment, but as an observation of fact, yeah? And the, and the more interesting question is, so what, in terms of good practices? So we're trying to extract it's very difficult because, as I say, it divides people, Protestants, Catholics, Man City, you know, um, Man United, and then you have Andro Android and uh, Apple. <coughs> and uh, I'm obliged legally to say there are other smartphone operating systems available, at least until next year. OK? <laughs> OK, so um, at least strain your sort of prejudices for a, for a little while longer in terms of your affiliations and just try to and, and, and the beauty of the framework is to some extent it, it helps you to do that to step back and be slightly more objective and this framework can be used more generically in trying to identify different types of capabilities including things like tacit knowledge more codified knowledge like reputations and brands and such like so it's quite a nice framework more generically of trying to step back and objectively trying to figure out, well, is that a capability or is it just something they do? Yeah, and that distinction is really important, okay? Because a capability contributes to some value creation and capture by definition. Okay, so let us begin. Okay, so um, the terminology um, is not sort of always obvious and it's not as important to figure out what box it goes in. But it's almost like a checklist to figure out, are we capturing all the tangibles, intangibles, codified, non-codified, etc. Um, so, for example, sometimes we substitute systems for functional capabilities, and it sort of works quite well. Um, down here, regulatory is a bit strong because it infers government and such like, which is not always or even often the case. It's more about more codified legal issues. Okay, so you can substitute the terms. You know, where flexible and agnostic on that. It's more really like a, an aid memoir to make sure that we extract all the relevant capabilities from the two examples. The other health warning before we begin, yeah, is that this is not a sort of company versus company, you know, uh, sort of business school, Microsoft versus IBM, you know, let the fight begin. Um, it's two different ways of innovating, yeah? Okay, so we're trying to understand what the advantages and drawbacks are each rather than is Apple better than Google? Um, let's discuss. Let's not. Yeah? Let's not. Okay? You need to drunk, discuss those things when you had a few drinks because you're never going to get anywhere. Okay? The idea is to extract good and poor practices, what they can and can't achieve better. Okay. Let's, let's try anyway. Okay, so the first one is more about legacy, position and such like. And we've raised this a few times, that it's not trivial that we, ha we have this idea of choice in strategy, but a lot of things, a lot of the advantages we have, but also some of the constraints we have, are based on prior uh, decisions and investments. Yeah? So they create what we're going to call positional opportunities and constraints. Okay? So what we can do now is shaped at least, not determined by what we've done in the past and what we're perceived to be also. Okay, so let's begin with Apple. Um, what sort of positional um, advantages does the way that Apple's gone about innovating in this particular market space. It's not generalised because it's made lots of mistakes and dead ends like any real organisation that have been sort of tipexed out of its history. But we're talking about the more successful sort of uh, entry into smartphones and such like. That's what we're confining it to. Yeah. yeah. Um, Apple can be described as a market leader. Like this set the pace for the smartphone industry. They set the standards for the smartphone industry. So they are sort of like the leaders in that industry as uh, compared to um, the later Android. Can we, can we unpack? The reason I want more precision is because it's helpful then to contrast it. Because I think within that, there are several things you've nested in there. Yeah, in terms of, um, I think you're right in terms of, if you like, technological leadership or, or functional leadership, what it can do tend to set the pace for what others have to do at the very least. I think you're right. So that's a very precise thing. But that's different to setting standards, because I think actually it's almost the polar opposite in terms of that. So let's unpack that a bit. Yeah. So certainly I think, um, um, and you can argue, or well, maybe you put it there, but I think it is more about positioning. Yeah. So certainly um, I'll call it functional um, leadership. Yeah. More like technology leadership? No, I mean, I, again, I'm doing a very bad 
brainstorming, because in brainstorming you're meant to you know, not evaluate. The thing is, Apple has had like a history yeah. over 20 years mm. of innovation. Yeah. It was from the GUI and the Mac to the iPod to yeah, yeah. Um, the iPhone to the iPad. Yeah. So You've missed out about five different products that failed in the market. Mm. Seriously, I mean, that's like the Apple website. I mean, you've got to be really careful about, that's why I'm saying, let's confine it to smartphones, because I think nobody can argue whatever their affiliations that they haven't been massively successful. And one of the questions you need to ask is why and how and how generalizable that is. I think if you go back beyond that, every case of an iPod, you can bring out the case of a huge disaster. Uh, and, and I think that's, we can't draw lessons very easily from that. But I think you're right, it has a, a perception, which I think actually is a, should go in that box, a perception of being a pioneer. And I qualify that very carefully. And that's very important in terms of how you position, how you price products and such like. So I think you're right. It has, and I think that's separate to this leadership thing. Um, I think, um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not dissing it and saying perception, because that, you know, again, it's Tom Peters who said, was it aggregate perception is reality? The idea is that, you know, if enough people believe it to be so, then it is so and they will behave as if it's so. And it's not quite right, as I say, you know, if you think there's a bridge there and everyone thinks there's a bridge there and there isn't a bridge there, bad things happen, yeah? But you get the point that if, if there's a perception, let's, let's rewind a little bit. It's a bit like Audi. Uh, Audi, um, <coughs> I'll be a little bit careful here. Audi has a consistent marketing message over maybe 15 years. It's actually incongruent with any objective fact and we worked in the car industry for eight years, and we benchmark processes and products. But I would bet that in terms of the target customers, the message is now accepted as truth, yeah? That it's technology-led and it's engineer-led and such like, you know? It's a division of Volkswagen which does certain things well and other things not so well. And that's a good example where I, I'm completely agnostic in terms of perception and reality, but perception as a pioneer is a legitimate positional advantage, yeah? Why do you think, why is that an advantage in itself? We can argue for a million years about whether it's true or not, but I'm arguing that's irrelevant in terms of behavior purchases. Perception um, uh, of a pioneer or an innovator, slightly different. Pioneer implies early to market. Innovator, sort of better and bigger and different, slightly different. But so what advantage, let's step back a bit, because what we're trying to do is look at generalizable lessons. We're not trying to say, you know, we will not in the next 45 minutes agree that one's better than the other. That's not the point. The point is to say, what's generalizable? And what does that model do better than that model, yeah? So what benefits could be and have a reputation as a pioneer have more generically? Well, it almost comes self fulfilling for Apple. I mean, you made the point that they're very carefully marketing their own story. Yeah. So if they succeed in that and then they release new technology, you buy in as consumers of, of the story, Yeah. then suddenly that that new product becomes the market leader, the story becomes self-fulfilling because mm. it's careful, managed kind yeah. of way of they've approached launching new products. Yeah. People will give you on, on, on balance, and this is generic, this is not an Apple observation. Generically, it does several good things for the organisation. Yeah. One is, if you get it right, it becomes self-fulfilling because people will reframe features as being innovative because they're in that product. It will create a halo in terms of pricing strategy. You can start to charge premium prices for mundane accessories and such like, which is a very smart thing. Not a very good thing, but a very smart thing. So there's a whole range of benefits if you can get that perception right. And the real thing in terms of innovation is that people will try out new products more readily. So going back to the discussion we had about diffusion and adoption, you know, controlling for everything else, if you have a reputation of pioneer, people are more likely to try out your new offerings than if you don't. So you create a confidence of trust in that. And you create as a result what I guess marketing guys are called some sort of brand loyalty. Yeah? And you find that. You find that in luxury cars, you find it in smartphones. People get on a trajectory and they tend not then to enter into competition with competing that. And that's smart if you're producing those products. We can step back in a moment and say, is it smart in terms of innovation in the system? It's a separate question. But as a strategy, that's a viable strategy, not just in smartphones, but elsewhere. Yeah? So that's interesting. So we've already identified a couple of things that go above and beyond that particular model. Yeah? Just Sorry, yeah. Um, talking about past investments and reputation, I yeah. to link the two together. Apple took the leap into the high street. They built bricks and mortar. Mm. People to go into. That's a good point, yeah. And feel their product. Yeah. And they've got a, a reputation for a friendly staff. Come on in and enjoy the experience. 
<coughs> yeah. who, I don't want to say second time in the market, but it's got the younger generation enjoys this. They can go and yeah, yeah. But it's interesting, again, um, the interesting thing is many of, the, many of the bits of, well, both models aren't really new, but it, they've been put into different contexts, and it's interesting to see how well or well they uh, don't work. So, that, so the tide outlet thing, again, is a very old-fashioned view, and Matt Suster used to have that with Panasonic shops, and Sony used, well, Sony still do, actually, and they're not very successful. So that's not an end in itself, but it can, where you have a product, and we'll get later on in terms of the other things, where you have a product that um, some of the attributes are about aesthetics and touch and feel, then you go back to our discussion of diffusion, yeah, trialability. Yeah, you can watch an advert on the TV with a load of teenagers dancing around in chinos and thinking, well, that doesn't appeal to me. But you know, if I experience then what a multi-touch screen or aesthetically how pleasing it might be, that's what I need to do, experience it. And there ain't no way they're gonna post it to you and use it for 24 days on your own sort of thing. So shops are a great way where you have an advantage in terms of touch, feel, and look for people to trial these things. And then you add the service wraparound you're talking about where you know, people come around the polo and can I help you, blah, 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 and show you how to use it, isn't it great, and that sort of thing. You create an additional thing. So I think that's very particular where aesthetic design and or touch and feel are very important. Yeah? So I think that is a smart thing. And I think you're right. That is, in certain markets, not universally, a, a, a smart way of, of building a, a sort of positional advantage. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you've got to be careful because they have been very shy. If you read the company history, and I have, believe me, they've invented everything. And then when you scratch below that, you say, well, that was an acquisition. That was an acquisition. That's still a court case. That's a court case. They acquired that from Xerox, but don't acknowledge it. You know, and, and so, again, I'm not saying it's bad. That's actually open innovation. But they're very good at appropriating these things. <coughs> because they're creating this perception of the, 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 the pioneer. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm saying it's quite clever because of the benefits that we get in terms of adoption and diffusion and such like. So it's, you know, if you get that right, it's very clever indeed. Whether it's true or not is almost by the, by the side. You, know, you could argue objectively, Sony's a more innovative company in terms of patents and new products and technologies and firsts, but it's a disaster case in terms of customer experience and, and products. <laughs> Yeah, it's the polar opposite, almost, of Apple. Um, maybe we need another column for Sony, but we could be here quite late. Yeah? Um, but I take your point, yeah. Certainly, they, that's part of this folklore of building this, and it's on their website and everything else. It's even in Wikipedia, the source of all knowledge. So it must be true, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. They, they acquired it from a, it's a PhD student, I think, actually. Must have, I'd be very rich or very stupid to sign it over. <laughs> I suspect the latter, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The main, the main advantage, positional advantage they have, is that they are cool. The brand is cool. And it's associated, I mean, it's something historical. Mm. Because even their computers were used for design and stuff like that, which are... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, all very, it's very consistent. With what's really clever, I think what's really clever, and again, I think we need to be careful about generalizing, but I think you're right. I think one of the things, I'm not convinced it's cool anymore, but the clever thing they've done is from being, if you like, counter-institutional, they define themselves by not being IBM and corporate. And then to carry that forward, and nobody challenges that when they had dominant market share in almost every market outside Asia. And so they actually become the norm, but they still promote this, it's again, it's, it's counter, yeah? counter the sort of industrial and corporate. So that's the really, I think the clever thing is go from a niche player in PCs to a dominant player in smartphones to play the same card. And that's very clever. So I'm gonna, rather than put call or counter, you know, uh, counter uh, culture, I think what the clever is is consistent branding, whether it be colors and music and the sort of demographic that they associate with. Despite the fact, I think the average age of an iPhone user is 45 or something. I say that, Sorry to offend people, by the way. I mean, I didn't mean 45 as if it's, how dare they? Um, but actually, it's quite an old demographic, um, partly because they can afford them and you know, they, they don't know any better sort of thing. But oh, I've shown my cards so, 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 so soon. So.